Okay, it's 2 o'clock here on a given Wednesday, the last day of our broadcast year. So it's a special day, and we're thinking about the new year already. Soon enough, you'll see. Special guest, old friend, and I mean that in every sense of the word, Mike Fitzgerald, who I grew up with in my, <laughs> my, my effort to become conscious <laughs> about the state of Hawaii. And he is now the CEO of the Denver South Economic Development Partners which is an economic development organization in Denver, Colorado. And we're calling this show Economic Development in America because Mike has seen the mainland and he's seen Hawaii. He knows what economic development is about. Welcome to the show, Mike. Jay, it's absolutely a delight to be here. Uh, I'm just here on vacation and I had no idea that I was both going to get to share some time with you and get <laughs> this kind of exposure. <laughs> I hope it's good. <laughs> hey, man. You know, welcome back. It's uh, so great to see you here on Bishop Street. This is your old stomping ground. It is. You spent several is. years here. Uh, I've been visiting all the old spots. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, and of course, it, it, for me, it, it brings a lot of memories back. Likewise. Oh, you know, I think, um, you know, we started together in about 2002 or so. When, when did you 2001, actually, 2001. 2001. This was a very formative time. January. It was. And you were the CEO of the of economic of uh, Enterprise Honolulu at the time, uh, which was a very vibrant organization under your command, and uh, was doing so many things all at the same time. It was a time when Act 221 was in full uh, throw, when the millennials, uh, then millennials, I shouldn't say, right. the younger generation, right. were coming back from they the were. mainland to you know search for their they fortune were. here. It's a Honolulu. constant flow. Constant flow all the time. They would yep. come back. And it was a time of great optimism, great promise, and you were at the center of it, and you were invigorating people. I hope you don't mind me saying that. You, you had a huge effect in the years you were here. Mm. Well, I'm, I would be very humble about that. I was mostly invigorated by the people. I <laughs> okay, <think>. all right. <laughs> no, it was a terrific uh, groundswell of enthusiastic people uh, looking to positive change in Hawaii, particularly around economic development and technology, and you were at the absolute epicenter of that. I was just becoming conscious. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I think you kind of were master of the game at that point. I was, I was trying to understand. I was trying to, you know, figure out what the um, the operative forces were, or who the leaders were. I was trying to figure out what the magic recipe was, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about in this show. I want to find the magic recipe. Mm. So before you came here, you were at the economic development uh, office, I don't know, for the lack of a better word, in Florida, Miami, right. I Flor guess? Enterprise Florida. Enterprise mm -hmm. Florida. Mm -hmm. oh, similar name, eh? <laughs> yeah, they had, this group had changed theirs from Ho uh, Honolulu Economic Development Board to Enterprise Honolulu before I got here, and I would have discouraged that, actually, but <laughs> okay. they had it done by the time I got here. Uh, and Ro was Robbie Arm involved at the time? When Robbie he, when was, he yes, yeah. yes, very much so. He was in the middle of everything. Yeah. Great positive force. Yeah. Really looking out to do what's best for the whole. Yeah, yeah. He was inspiring to be with. He's a consultant with. now with the governor. I don't know if you know that. Oh, I, di I didn't, but he would yeah. be a good consultant because he, he's plowed a lot of ground here, thought deeply about all of this. He's really one of the assets of this place yeah. he's now and behind. in the future. Yes, I agree. He's got a long way to go. And we have many things to do. <laughs> Every place does. <laughs> These are times of change. So take us back to your experience in, uh, in Miami, in the Enterprise Florida. Um, that's where you, is that where you originally cut your teeth on uh, no, that was No, no, no. I started out in Montana, running Montana National Trade Commission, or first with the governor of Montana, then Montana National Trade Commission, then I did the Washington State Economic Development Board in Washington then was director of the Department of Commerce in Washington, then went to Florida, then came here. Okay. And wow. Now Colorado. You can get to know quite a few people doing that. Oh, yeah. You know, I anybody that's working in economic development, you're working with a whole cross-section of the community generally. So what is exactly economic development? Economic development is, you know, I'm sure there's a thousand different definitions, but if economic development is, it might be easier to say rather than the definition, if economic development is working, Businesses are successful, they're growing, they're diversifying, people are getting excellent paid jobs. The ripples of that are go through the whole community. Everybody benefits. My own definition is that when economic development's working, you're really part of a dream machine because you're creating dreams for people. 
dreams for businesses, dreams for entrepreneurs are becoming successful. People are getting good jobs. They're being able to take care of their families. They're sending their kids to school. They're secure. Uh, and the ripples that come out of that come success for everything else, support for the arts, support. People are aware of the environment if they have a good paying job. Until they do, they're not too focused on that. People support all kinds of community stuff once they're feeling secure themselves. So I've come to believe, not just because I'm in this, I'm in this because I come to believe this. A, every family needs one good job at least, somebody with a good job. And if they do, you would eliminate half of all the need for public assistance. You would put a lot of solidity uh, in families, stability in communities. And until, unless we get that you know, globally, we're not going to have the kind of calm, peace, support for the environment, for social causes, for cultural causes, tolerance for various racial uh, groups, until people feel pretty secure in themselves. And a good paying job does that. Raise up the community, you raise everybody in Raise it, that up. And uh, you have a better life for everyone. Right. And, and good economic development does that to benefit the whole, not a special elite or not one group, or it's not just technology, it's not just any one category. It's across all categories. I was going to ask you, what role does technology play, you know, in at least your perception of economic Technology is the great empowerer now. I mean, technology is really the foundation of almost all of life, not just <laughs> development. And it will probably become more so. Technology is neutral in and of itself. It's the values we bring to it that determine whether it's a big asset or not. Maybe a big liability. A big liability. I mean, I'm always reminded of the same technology that sends men to the moon and sends satellites up is the exact same technology. It'll send a nuclear warhead any place in the world in 15 minutes. It's what do we, how do we agree to use it? Yeah. And probably with biotech, there's all kinds of positives and negatives that are growing there that we aren't even aware of. But it's the value base that's brought to it. So it isn't a coincidence that all these states have economic development organizations. It sounds to me, and I'm guessing, that it sounds to me at some point in the American development, in the economic development of the country, somebody had an idea, probably in Washington, that we ought to have economic development organizations in the states on a local basis trying to raise up the economy locally. Is this true? What happened? You know, the history of it is it's not that old, really. It's only become kind of, I would say, even a legitimate profession starting in the 80s. Prior to that, there were a few scattered examples of it. It really started in the South, where the states got together and tried to package and sell cheap labor. And that's when they started to get the manufacturing. That was probably the genesis of it in the U.S. to bring manufacturing down from the North right? because the labor was cheap. Got exactly. I I, that was kind of, that was the... Garment center thing. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> exactly right. <laughs> the, that was the genesis of it. But now it is really a pervasive uh, piece of work. And it's different in any community or every community you go to. But basically, it's bringing the public sector and the private sector together with a common vision to create prosperity in the community. That's what it's done. And there's many different ways to do that. Technology is certainly a major, powerful one. But it certainly isn't the only one. I mean, the arts are important. Education is important. Uh, and recreation is enormously important, as we're experiencing here. And you do. This is what you're built on here. So there are many, many ways to create prosperity. And a good economic development program will tend to pretty much in support all of those yeah. in some way. Those are all related. Yeah. They're all related. And everything's related to everything else. That's just it's quantum physics yeah. at the yeah. economic level, literally. Now, what, what about funding? I mean, I get the sense that economic development organizations around the country are all built on lo local funds, state funds. Is it right? You know, it's, it's very, it's, uh, there's a variety of ways that this is done. The common way is for like a chamber of commerce or an economic development organization to be privately put together and then try to get funds from the business community primarily or the local government or the combination, sometimes the university, sometimes the economic development administration, the feds, or, or a combination of all of those. A mistake I think that we make in the United States uh, in compared to Europe or Asia is we don't seriously fund economic development efforts at the local level. So people that are running these things, and this is the one, the job I have now is the first time I haven't had to do that, either be begging money from a legislature or from companies, is we don't fund them well enough. So basically, most organizations, economic development organizations, spend 50% of their time just rattling the tin cup. And that's really, uh, so they can't create the expectations that everybody has about them, because they're spending half of the time not doing the work. They don't vary, they can't hire and pay people well generally. 
they can't take any kind of a long-term approach. They can't hire consultants. They can't look at like at a five-year strategy because they don't know if they're going to have enough yeah. funds. But it works uh, well when it's funded. And the organization I'm working with now have created a special taxing district where all of the companies along I-25 in our p territory in Arapahoe and Douglas counties have agreed to a two mil levy on their commercial property tax. And that's what funds our organization to do both uh, transportation infrastructure <coughs> And economic development and entrepreneurial support. Worth it. It's worth it because it it has a, a direct effect, really, on all the people who are participating. Oh, it is. Th this group's been very, very successful. They've been in business 30 years. They were the initiators of the light rail. They've built almost all the infrastructure. Uh, they've created well in this area now, and I've only been there five years, so really, I cannot take credit for any of this. There's 800,000 people in these two counties, probably. Um, there's 20,000 businesses. Most of Colorado's Fortune 500 are located in these two counties, and they do 30% of Colorado's total earned income they generate it in those two counties every year. <coughs> so and it's a very diversified economy. It's very it's tech, but it's not just tech. It's you, many, you the, many things. You were the CEO of the uh, Florida Economic right. Development Enterprise. That's the whole state. Right. In this case, we're talking about two counties, the microcosm. Two counties, Denver yeah. South. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about Florida for a minute. Okay. Um, you, when you came here, you, you had an incredible record in Florida. You had done amazing things. Can you talk about your experience in Florida? Yeah, when, and it's not me, Jake. I think the key is, the key to economic development is building a good team that has a common vision with a lot of diverse talents that you can bring to bear. I mean, it's definitely not a one or two person or even a dozen. It's, you know. You did that here too. If you're you built a team. Yeah, yeah, if you're successful, there'll be dozens of people that have their fingerprints on that success, however mm -hmm. you define that. But uh, Florida was the first state in the United States to take their State Department of Commerce and make it privatized or partly privatized. It created a public private partnership where the governor was still chair. The governor and the state funded maybe 25% of it. The private sector paid all the rest. So it was a hybrid organization. Because of that, though, it operated with a great, great more, much more freedom than most of these that are in a government. They have to be very, very restrictive. They can't, like, buy dinner, so you can't, you know, t you have to be very careful where you travel and rationalizing it all. But we had a staff of 60 people, probably $30 million budget, my own travel budget, and that was $40,000. We had 15 foreign offices, literally. It was like Other a country. Place, you know, Florida, Florida by itself would be about the 20th biggest country in the world, if you're just in their, you know, the scale of it. So it was a big operation. Lots of the focus was South America, but also uh, we did lots of business in Europe, lots of business in Asia. So we were on that circuit all the time. So when you say lots of business, you mean you were in you're achieving foreign investment right most of that was foreign yeah, most of that business. was foreign direct investment of bringing companies in to the state of Florida from South America from uh, Europe from even North Africa from Asia from all over so it isn't necessarily cash it's uh, you know cash investments it's bring your business um, and set right. up shop here exactly build a building exactly. hire people that's what, make that's what foreign direct investment yeah, is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were able to do that in, in a substantial way in Florida? We were because we had this capacity, this funding capacity that really let us have enormous ability to go and do and try stuff. And if it didn't work, change that and d until we could figure out what worked. That's what business <laughs> is all about. That's key. <laughs> and that's what so many chambers and EDCs are, have that restriction. You know, they get one shot at one thing. If it doesn't work, people go away or they won't continue funding, whatever. We made lots of tries until we figured it out. When I first got there, uh, we did a survey of uh, some of the chief CEOs in the Fortune 500 and others. What was their what was their impression of the business climate of Florida? And they had none. I mean, so we were at least starting from neutral ground. It wasn't awful, but it had just been a place that had done agriculture, tourism, uh, senior retirees, and pretty much the drug trade for as long as anybody could remember. So the first thing we did was put together a team and went around and started meeting with companies, meeting with site selectors, telling them what was their and that got the spiral going. So can you, we, we're going to go to a break now, but can you give me a metric to demonstrate how, how, uh, what kind of accomplishments you achieved in Florida? Oh my gosh. We won the President's uh, Export Assistance Award for mounting two years, three years in a row that I was there. I was only there for f four and a half for getting the most small businesses 
to become successful exporters out, outside of the country. We attracted $11 billion, and this is all, they, they had to document this. Sure. Working there, I would never do this again, but we had to, we had to qualify as a, but for the assistance of Enterprise Florida, we had to show this company wouldn't be here, so you couldn't kind of the generally. The of Christmas future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we were held to really rigid standards yeah. because of uh, the legislative funding. But we, the, during the time I was there, we rolled in 11 billion new direct foreign investment. Impressive. Yeah, it was, it was. Hey, and we created more jobs in the four years that I was there than California did with twice as big a population. <laughs> that says something too. Yeah, yeah, and these are all documented by outside, not by me. That's uh, Mike Fitzgerald, uh, he's the CEO of Denver South. Now he's the CEO of Denver South Economic Development Partners. And he was the uh, uh, CEO of uh, Enterprise Honolulu, which is the economic development organization here in Oahu for several years, and we want to talk to him about it, all the lessons he's learned and what he can share with us now about how to go forward in Hawaii. After a while, you've made so many mistakes, you start learning from them, Jake. <laughs> you, don't, you don't make so many anymore, hopefully. We'll right back. <laughs> Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon, and on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space. And uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stan the Energy Man, Stan Osterman, and I'm here to tell you about my show on Friday, every Friday, on my lunch hour, 12 o'clock till one o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about everything energy and anything you ever wanted to know about energy. So we're full of energy and we'll see you here every Friday at noon to one. Aloha. Okay, we're back, we're live. I'm okay. Jay Fidel uh, here on uh, Think Tech Talks, Economic Development in America with Mike Fitzgerald. Great to have you here, Mike. It's great to be here, Jay. So, <clears throat> so we're, gonna, we're gonna hold on Hawaii for a minute because that's the part I wanna focus on. But after Hawaii, you went, as w where you are now, the CEO of uh, Denver South Economic Development Partners. And not to say we didn't have some contact beforehand, because I, I had a number of radio shows with Robert Olson. Yeah. It was uh, yep. kind of the federal economic development right. uh, agency of the Department of Commerce during that right. time. And we talked about, about his project, which was the new Fitzsimmons. Right. Which I like to talk to you about. That's a big... So compare for me uh, Denver versus Florida versus Hawaii. Well, Denver has really uh, kind of come on in the last 30 years. If you went to Denver 30 years ago, it was, play, it was known as a flyover. I mean, it was in the middle of pretty much nowhere. It still is now, but now it's all of the dynamics have changed. Uh, when I, I'm from Montana, so all of my lifetime I had been coming and going in Denver. But I hadn't been there since 1985 or 86 when I moved to Seattle. And when I went back for this interview in... Um, 2010, May 2010, I couldn't believe the changes that they'd made. Denver International Airport is now the fifth busiest airport in the United States. 200,000 people go through there a day. It's the 15th busiest airport in the world. That's changed the whole dynamics of what can happen there. Uh, it's so a hub airport for a number a, of airlines. Yeah, it's a hub yeah. airport for a number of airlines. And when you go there now, uh, well, this was my experience. When I flew in there and saw this incredible airport, I'd read about it, but I had never been there since they put it together. Then come through town, they have these amazing sports facilities, amazing first class, uh, really iconic, architecturally designed uh, uh, cultural facilities, symphony. I mean, it's, it, it used to be just kind of this cowboy place out in the plains, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's totally transformed now and probably has one of the most diverse economies really in the country. And all that was there when I got there. So it was easy to like this place. And when I met with the people that were doing the interview for me, they hadn't done really any economic development. They'd been building the transportation infrastructure, the diversified housing, business parks, a lot of stuff. They had a lot of good companies there. They're preparing for your arrival. Apparently so. It the was infrastructure <laughs> for you to work on. Yeah, it was like the uh, <laughs> like God sent me from, uh, OK, here's your payoff for a lot of <laughs> not successful work. But um, they had really built a phenomenal 
uh, community, and it's two, co it's two uh, counties, Arapahoe and Douglas County. There's five jurisdictions in there. So the jurisdictions, the cities, the counties, and the private sector are all members. And because of this uh, district tax on the companies, everybody's pretty much a member of the organization. But we don't have to raise any money. That just the better we do, the better we do. That cash flow That's comes great. in a year, about five million a year now, and it's increasing. So, what role does tech play in this success? Oh, tech is a big player in this success. Um, the telecommunication industry began right in the backyard of Denver South. Uh, Daniels created the first real telecom company there. Now it's a, it's a, 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 uh, Echo Star, <laughs> a Disc. Liberty Media, they're all there. They are all have big headquarters there. And uh, that's, that's been one of the foundations of technology. And then the stuff that gets spun out of there. And a lot of the stuff gets spun out of there. They collaborate with the, uh, the, with the military, the, uh, the uh, aerospace industry. We have the second largest aer in aerospace industry in the world in Denver, Colorado, in employment and companies. And there's a lot of collaboration between telecom, which is sending up rockets, and the aerospace are building those rockets. So that's one of the major ones. Uh, but there's a lot of finance companies there. There's a lot of, um, we have the highest per capita of engineers in the United States in Denver South. Uh, so that's a, really a juggernaut. And that, that doesn't include the engineers that work just like the aerospace company. These would be private firms that are mm -hmm. doing some kind of technology work. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, um, Oh my God! There's just so many J. It's Let me ask you about the new Fitzsimmons. The, the the shows that I was referring to was uh, were shows by yeah, a guy yeah. named Bob uh, Olson. Bob right. Olson, who was uh, I think he at first when I first uh, met him he was the manager, uh, whatever title, of the new Fitzsimmons as a research park, a research facility, and the, later on became the uh, economic development person for the gov for the federal government. Right. In that area. I guess he still is doing that. Yeah, I think he is, yep. And uh, with the remarkable thing, to tell you the story, because I think this is part of your shtick over there, uh, I asked him, how did you get all these national pharma companies to come and set up shop, do research at the right. new Fitzsimmons? Um, and he said, simple, it was breakfast. <laughs> I, I had a T-shirt made for Ed Cadman. <laughs> here That's in Jackson, great. because he was trying to do the same yeah, thing, yeah, right? Yeah. Big, big pharma. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So the t-shirt said, breakfast <laughs> in Kaka'ako. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. There you go. I think we might have some left. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so no. said, what do you mean breakfast? Why does breakfast, you know, bring mm -hmm. researchers from all over the country and all these big pharma companies? Why? He said, because nothing, scientists like nothing better than to tell other scientists what they've been doing. A researcher doesn't True. have a chance to talk about it. If you give them a chance to talk about it over food at breakfast in a safe, nurturing environment where people will appreciate what he's saying and they won't, you know, go steal his intellectual property or anything, right, right. Um, have them talk to each other. They love it. It's professionally gratifying. And that's the magic. That, that was, was the magic what he worked. Yeah. Well, it is a juggernaut now. <laughs> it's one of the biggest uh, medical centers in the United States and growing probably much faster than many others. Interesting. They really There's probably 10,000 employees there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's a, co it's a huge complex. It covers acres and acres. Yeah. So that's Denver. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, it's, there's, actually, Boulder is the real technology uh, generator in Colorado. But others have started to be that as well. And three years ago, we were doing nothing in Denver South to support technology startups. But we're definitely on the radar screen now. We've launched uh, Prime Health, which is a digital health uh, nationwide now organization that's supporting digital health companies. And uh, we're just starting with the Internet of Things. We're working for Aero Electronics, which is a big, big company that's located there. There may be like 130 on the Fortune 500. But it, it excels. It's a sort of geometrical, logarithmic acceleration. I mean, it, it's, it works like a magnet. The more you have, the more right. others are interested in coming. They do. More and more people want to come there. And because we're attract, such an attractive place for millennials, uh, we have a workforce that is one of the highest educated in the United States. Colorado can't really take credit for that because they have one of the lowest funded uh, K through 12 programs. People have just come there, but I think second only to Boston is the educational level in Denver or the metro area. So how has it affected the quality 
of the community and uh, com life in the community you know, to see all this, uh, all this accomplishment? Well, it's kind of like a, uh, people there love it. I mean, I've only been, lived there six years, uh, so I'm probably not the best contextual person to talk about it, but people that have been there a long, long time love it because the, wealth, the new wealth creates many, many thousands of new jobs and well-paying jobs. The average job pay in our area is between seven hundred two or seventy to two hundred thousand dollars. That's the average. Wow. Just in the time I've been there, we have attracted fifty-seven new companies that are creating forty thousand new jobs, average seventy to eighty thousand, but many of them are way higher than that. Two billion dollar payroll annually. And it's the payroll that we really try to focus on. I mean, the developers want to, you know, they want a million dollar or a million square foot design build. Yeah. We get some of those, but to really benefit the community, it's the payroll that economic development should be paying well, attention that's a to. That's the standard of the quality of life in the community. It, it is, because the more jobs you have, then everything else works. Yeah. And so there's enormous, uh, big, generous support. We have the highest, per in call of the Denver metro area, highest per capita support for the arts of any community in the United States. They have a referendum they, f they pass annually that gives money support to all of the arts organizations, symphonies, theater, the whole works. And then, of course, the recreation is, you know, as good as sure. probably as in the world. Big as all outdoors, yeah. Yeah. So uh, interesting um, that, um, uh, there was a, a, a piece on NPR this morning, I mentioned it to you, uh, a professor of uh, business at MIT, a woman, I can't remember her name, she's talking about whether the new um, wage increases in half a dozen states going into effect on January 1st next week, um, what, what effect will that have on those locations? I mean, is that going to solve the problems that the increase in minimum wage, uh, you know, is intended to solve? And the answer, according to her, was no. Um, you know, it's a buck or two more. It doesn't mean that much. And you, you can't have, um, you know, you, it's not a living wage in the communities in which it is being paid. This is very sad, especially as against the kinds of wages you are describing in, in, in Denver. Right. The kinds of wages that technology can bring. Right. See, okay. if you get a... Um a $70,000 job will create a $50,000 and a $25,000 job with it. You get, a do you get almost a two for one, three for one in some of the bigger ones, depending on the company. That's where the leverage is, because you get the higher paying jobs, but also you get the, the lower paying. But the lower paying job is still going to be twenty five dollars to $30,000. It's not going to be a $10 an hour job. It's going to be a $15 yeah, an hour yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's, what, that's what you need to be paying attention to leverage. Because what's key is if people have a job, you start to minimize the demand on the public policy support system. And f what people I think are, I hope they're starting to understand is that, for instance, there, um, the average wage, or excuse me, the average self-sufficiency standard, say for a family of four, would be 60,000 minimum. That's for food, fuel, housing, transportation, child care, health care. And that's not lush, that's just the basic stuff you need. If people don't have a job and they aren't paying that themselves, they're going to be on somebody's social system role. So you pay. Anyway. You pay one way or another. <laughs> and if people think they don't pay, and these people end up in the justice system, they're going to be paying as much as if they were sending that person to Harvard every year, because it costs as much to put somebody in prison <laughs> as it does to send them to Harvard. So you don't get out of that. That's why the jobs are really so critically important and good paying jobs. Okay, so once you Without know, that, you, j you can't put enough p patching up around things to support right. a system because everything, you know, the security systems, the police forces, the, right. the welfare systems. All these other systems, expenses you yeah. have to incur to catch up. And you do whether you see them or acknowledge them or not, they're there. Yeah, they're there. Okay, so now, now with that background, okay. with the basic uh, principles, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about Mike's experience in Honolulu and what we can learn from his experience elsewhere to, to try to do things in Honolulu a little better. Okay? This is Think Tech. That's Mike Fitzgerald. We'll be right back.
Aloha. Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at ThinkTech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. Hi, my name is Hilary Weinberg. I'm the host of The Whole Gamut on ThinkTech Hawaii. See us live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. or on our YouTube channel to hear us talk about world affairs from Hawaii and beyond. See you then. Aloha! How you doing? They wanted more welfare. They wanted all kinds of other things. Now it's a good job. Okay, we're back. Oh, here we are. Okay. Okay, whoa! <laughs> That's Mike Fitzgerald. Uh, he's the CEO of Denver South Economic Development Partners which is an economic development organization, Denver. And we're talking about his career, I suppose, and the lessons that he's learned here and elsewhere about economic development. But now we're at, we're at the most important part of the show, and that is, um, you know, from all that you've learned and seen uh, here and elsewhere, and now on this trip you're making, we have the benefit of asking you for your advice. Wow, what a great Whoa. moment. Yeah? Dangerous, <laughs> dangerous ground. So are, 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 are jobs uh, sufficiently uh, high pay enough here in Honolulu to make it work? Well, I've been gone for six years, and it looks like, you know, cr the cranes might be the new state bird of Hawaii. <laughs> uh, the explosion of growth is uh, pretty amazing. And, of course, this time of year, you'd expect all the streets to be filled, and there are. Uh, the amount of people here is just overwhelming, so the tourist industry must be flourishing. But... I would have to really look at it closer and know the numbers, Jake. But generally speaking, when I was here before, that's six years ago, also the uh, self-sufficiency standard in downtown Honolulu was about 60000 for a family of four. The average wage was 23000 And that's why in most Hawaiian families, or many Hawaiian families, people had to have three jobs because they had to somehow cobble that together. And in most of these minimum wage jobs, they don't get insurance, or many of them they don't. They don't get health insurance. They don't get any kind of retirement. There's no kind of security building in that now, whether that's the same or changed. And it wouldn't be significantly different here than it is in a lot of other places. So, I mean, Hawaii wouldn't be unique in that. But until you get that spiral going up, you cannot solve, it's just an illusion that you're going to solve any of the social issues. Yeah. You can't until people are financially secure. Very f People can't then move to the next stage of being concerned about the environment, uh, supporting of the arts, uh, making sure their children are growing up and are equipped to be contributing citizens in the next epic. That stuff just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. They're, they're too desperate. People are desperate just to get through Monday through Friday. And now what I found, and this not here, this is, this is everywhere, not just even in the United States, people our age, and this is due to the meltdown, it's really exasperated this, but they are worried about their children. Are they getting an education that's going to equip them to be able to make a living, even live well, half as well as they are? Are they going to be safe, secure? Are they going to avoid drugs, et cetera, et cetera? So they're worried about their children on one end. They're worried about their parents. Are we going to have enough resources to take care of mom and dad through their last years? And they're worried about whether they're going to have their job on Monday morning. So you wonder why people aren't broadly engaged in social activities in, in, in the political world. The they, they can't even look up from that. No, yeah. and that's probably two-thirds of the population. Yeah. You were talking about the South before, and I remember a book called Nickled and Dimed. That's you remember The that Waitress, book? absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah that definitely. Was a really that's a chilling book. It's a, and it's, it's reality, I think. It was a New York Times reporter. She divested herself of, of any money. She went into the South. She worked for big box stores and try to survive as a, as a single woman um, on whatever she could make from the big box stores. And she found that she could not. But was, what was most interesting and what she revealed in the book is that the people around her were all on this kind of treadmill. Goebbels they were. Yeah. And there was no way they yeah. could get out, they of it. get out of it. And there's no way they could get their children educated right. to get out of it. And they were in this kind of perpetual rat race spiral down. Um, and that is the backwater. That is what we have to worry about. That is the ultimate penalty that a community pays for not building a better economy. It, it does. And I, I could speak now way more uh, about the whole U.S. than I can Hawaii because I haven't been here uh, for half of a decade. Things can change enormously. But in the United States, basically, the middle class is decimated. 
they can't, they, one, they've lost their jobs, they're working at inferior things, they're working at minimum wage or something not much more than that. Many of them are trying to become entrepreneurs, but you know, that's a one in a hundred kind of shot of who gets enough to even pay their rent becoming an entrepreneur. They're not able to fund and send their children to school. College debt has become so overwhelming because of the structure of the university systems there, which is just abysmal, that it's trapping people not even the middle class, but the middle class is sinking, and the one or two or five percent is growing enormously of the of the wealthiest. But that doesn't help the other. The, it doesn't, the great and, and it's hollowing out the country. And I, I I remind myself all the time that if you don't have a middle class, you don't have a democracy, no matter what you call it. And we're moving swiftly away from that right now. And when you see the current political <laughs> presidential race in the United States. Seems closer still. <laughs> seems closer still because you have to remind yourself that that group is a symptom of the culture. It's not creating the culture. That's what's coming out of the culture that we've created in the United States. Yeah. And it's damn chilling. Okay, so this is the big payoff now. This justifies your whole trip. Okay. <laughs> what do we do? What do we do nationally and what do we do in Hawaii? people are not going to like the answer to this because there's one there's no easy shortcut for this this is going to be generational now because in the united in the in the mainland we probably have two or three generations that haven't got an education that really equipped them to be very competent stuff so that that's got to be retooled we need to uh, we need more of an apprentice system than more c colleges uh, we need because people can get technically trained or even not just technically but trained to be very competent and make a living wage without going to college. 75% of the jobs, you don't need a university degree. Uh, maybe two years, but we all need continual learning. So we all have to keep retooling or, you know, that technology will leave us quickly I, I hope you're writing this down. Continual yeah. learning, that should be on oh, the Oh yeah, list. no, yeah. lifelong learning. The w people that become lifelong learners are doing the, themselves the best favor they can, both for themselves and their contributor to the society. That, that's got to happen. You've got to have, we've got to create well accessible and affordable education ongoing for people. Some of that's going to be technical workforce. Some of it's just going to be learning how to read, write, think, and make a contribution. Some of it's just going to be good manners and how to get along in the workplace. I mean, all of that's important now. Uh, certainly there's going to be plenty of work that needs to be done. It's whether we have political and community and business leaders that are smart enough to structure the system that allows that to happen. Recently, we've pretty much had takers, not givers. Yeah. I mean, there are happy some exceptions to that, but most everybody's grabbing and pulling up the ladder jack, I've got mine. Y you, we will hollow out the United States, big as it is, and it's big. We're still the biggest economy in the world, 25% of the global economy with only 5% of the population, still probably amongst the best universities in the, United, or in the world. Many assets, just you know, natural resources, space, land, laws, uh, still easier to probably create an entrepreneurial business there than almost anywhere. Well, we have to be aware of the direction, the dynamic we're going. The dynamic is not good. Yeah. It is not good. It's yeah. like a, we're in a downward spiral that nobody's, you aren't hearing it even talked about by politicians, even at the local level. They either don't know how to talk about it anymore or they're not willing to because it's too controversial. Yeah. If you say anything that anybody else disagrees with, you bring the wrath upon you. Yeah. It's become impossible, I think, in the United States, even at a dinner party, where you have pretty much people that know each other, to have a lively, spirited conversation where people can uh, happily disagree with each other That's and still true. be friends. That's the exception, not the rule. It that is, is so true. So it's not they that is, you know, it's, okay. we're, we're, all, we're really so getting less So the second tolerance. thing you should write down, next time you go to a dinner party, Tell the truth. <laughs> Tell the truth. <laughs> Tell them how you really feel. And then really be ready feel. to run out the door. <laughs> no, I think it's just we've become, uh, we, and I, I'm no, I don't hold myself as an exception to this. I have strong opinions about all of this stuff. But we've become very intolerant of any ideas or any systems or any styles of living or any religious or philosophical beliefs beyond our own rather than embracing those. And we've got to get to that point to embrace it. That's one of the enormous assets of Hawaii is you have more diverse population that gets along here and embraces each other and celebrates these culture than almost any place on the planet. Going into the future, that very well could be one of your single best, most important assets. We have to play on that. And furthermore, I'd like to say we have to extend it 
so that we don't live in silos. No silos are permitted. Everybody has to think out of the box. Outthinking, they call it. Out yeah, thinking. no, no, it is. And, and for those that do it, they'll find life is way more interesting to have a diverse group of friends than just yeah. people that agree with you. Yeah. But we've kind of degenerated in the U.S. to I only want to be friends with and I only want to have dinner party with and I only want to hang out with or go to the bar with people that reinforce my own bias <laughs> beliefs, whatever they are. It's comfortable. It's more comfortable. We don't yeah, want to be uncomfortable yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at a time when, you know, we just, the world is changing. We live at a time of the mass, most massive discovery is an invention ever in history. Nothing is going to remain the same for any amount of time at all. Change is the only law of life now, and it's, it's accelerating. I mean, you've got to really be just working diligently not to be a techno peasant every 24 hours. <laughs> but that's just part of it. It's all these collages of beliefs and ideas. What we forget in the United States, I think, is that's what built the United States is when we open that up and let people come from everywhere, it was the conflict of those beliefs or the interchange, the integration of those beliefs. Fermentation. And fermentation. It was a yeasty culture, and it was out of that that came this great invention that made the United States the success it was over the last 250 years. Okay, take years. an assumption with me, Mike. Okay. Let's assume those cranes you see, that activity you see, it's all in tourism and it's all in building condos for faraway investors who are going to spend far more money on a condo sure. than any of us can afford. Sure. And little by little, you know, that's where the state, maybe big by big, <laughs> that's where the state is going. At the same time, those hundred million con dollar condos look down on, on a, st a street filled sure. with homeless people who really don't have a hopeful future. Um, you just look down on a, on, a, on, a, on a community full of schools that are pumping their best and brightest out uh, to the mainland, never to return in this life. Yep. Uh, so my question to you, and this is a hard one, is given all that you know, including your time here six years ago, uh, what do we do here? This is, you know, a moment historically for me to ask you this question. Okay, well, I th and, and I think it's a good question. And I know that there's been a lot of thinking about this here because there was a lot during the time I was here, not from me, but in the whole environment. But I certainly embraced it. Hawaii has the opportunity to be the most sustainable example of prosperity on the planet. No place has more diverse potential energy, alternative renewable energy, and no place can grow more diverse food, 365 days of growing capacity, yet you import 90% of the, all the food here True. and about 90% of all the energy. True. Enormous expenses go with that. When you Think of what you would employ if you internalized that and the wealth you would save. It would be billions. Well, I once did a paper on this that's lying around there somewhere. Because uh, that, that would be a good place to start because you'd employ so many people and you're becoming more resilient, more self-sufficient, and you're going to start paying way more attention to the environment. There is a picture at the Bishop Museum of an Ahupua'a. That's what Kamehameha organized when he came. And it goes from the top of the mountain to the bottom out into the sea. It is a perfect visual of what sustainable development is. Sustainable development isn't a technique, it's an ethic. So the people at the very top have to be very cautious of what they're doing all the way down for the people that are living under them because their lives are all connected. If they kill off something, they're going to hurt themselves and it goes all the way out into the ocean. You should have one of those on your wall back here, Jay. <laughs> it is a fabulous piece. Nobody, nobody else has that kind of living legacy in the world as this place does. If you just added now technology to that and modern thinking, you would be a global model. And it would happen very, very quickly. Sustainability is what's at the heart of changing climate change. If we can't become sustainable, we can't touch that issue. So you have to integrate all these things. They're all connected. Sustainable uh, environment, sustainable economy, sustainable jobs, sustainable everything. And if I, was, uh, if I was to recommend what can you do to be the model in the future, and you could probably have, have this well underway within a decade and be a global model within a generation, that would be it. And it would change the physical environment here also considerably. And it wouldn't be a handful of outsiders building condos of a million dollars. What that would do is benefit the whole. You would turn this into a place where every single person here mattered because they'd have an important role. 
whether it was just to take care of their child and make sure they grew up competent, or started the village theater, or help clean up the Iowa, or whatever it was. Everybody would have a role. You Mike Fitzgerald, uh, CEO of uh, Denver South Economic Development Partners, uh, formerly the CEO of um, uh, Enterprise Honolulu here in Hawaii, uh, talking about uh, economic development in America and in Hawaii in uh, a really important discussion. And I hope you tell your friends about this so they can watch too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jake, Mike. Thanks, Wonderful thanks to so have much. You it's here wonderful to, see you. to reconnect. Aloha. Here. I love.